Welcome to final part six of Mr. England's story. Mr. England, our listeners would probably agree that what you describe represents shocking improprieties and institutional dysfunction, remarkably at a prestigious Swiss university. How would you respond to someone who simply says, but he isn't telling the truth? This podcast is available to the public. I am liable for content. I am prepared to present evidence as stated here and more in the form of documents and witnesses. Can you explain to our audience how this story conforms in any way to common sense? Professors and the head of media acting as if in a dark Shakespearean drama? I believe there is an explanation that makes some sense. First of all, We make a mistake when we assume that well-educated people are more virtuous than anyone else. Education influences one part of the mind. It does not instill morality. Little of history needs to be revisited to quickly prove that. Ask yourself, though, how would you react if a person at your workplace were suspected of being a fugitive who is armed and dangerous? All of the extreme activities that I describe here start from one seminal event when Google information was distributed at a university meeting. False conceptions and fear took over. The rectorate failed to dispel the fear. Good judgment disappeared like a flock of birds from a cannon shot. This story raises a question. How can we ensure that rationality prevails at our institutions in the treatment of workers? Shakespeare claimed that insanity drives the world. You won't prove him wrong with this story. At many junctions over one and a half years, where the choice was simply follow the established appropriate rules or slip something by inappropriately behind the scenes, the latter was generally selected. I saw a few good people, the Ombuds Committee, for example, attempt to bring rationality to the situation, but they failed. It should also be remembered I was teaching students at a university. They searched Google. I had received no backing from the university to reassure them. I informed students, but it was negligent of the university not to make a pronouncement. Either release me on appropriate grounds or explain the unusual circumstances to the students. The university had no good reason to release me. My work was good. I had not violated Swiss law. I was well liked by students. The sexual harassment accusation must simply have been too expedient and therefore seductive. One point puzzles me. Did the university expect you to tolerate the improper conduct that you describe to the point of even passively accepting a false criminal accusation? I believe they were under the influence of the false Google profile. They saw what they wanted to see, provided by the U.S. lawyers. It is hard to imagine their overtly unjust conduct toward me, if not based on their assumption of a fundamental weakness attributable to me. That error in judgment has resulted in a lawsuit for professors and my accuser. I suspect they thought I would not fight back. The circulation of frightening information may explain the reactions, but it does not excuse violations of work rules and law, the disregard for existing work agreements, misuse of an accusation of sexual harassment, termination of scientific projects, and threats of expulsion towards student supporters. How do you feel about your accuser, the woman who worked with you? I think she was used She became frightened by the controversy that surrounded me. I doubt very much that she intended to cause this trouble. I doubt that she agreed to have the university guidelines violated. Those guidelines would have protected her as well as me. Are you expecting a blowback from the university, a shoot the messenger type situation? I think that has already occurred. They want to keep this story quiet but it has public significance. I would like our audience to consider, 
not only is Switzerland a premier democracy, it also ranks very well on a scale of corruption. In this case, I am the bearer of bad tidings. What I say causes some anxiety. More than anyone else, I would be happy if these things had not evolved as I describe, but they did. So what happened at the University of Basel cannot be expected to stand in any measure in Switzerland if this good reputation is to prevail meaningfully. And who do you hold responsible for what you have described to us? For the lawsuit and negative publicity for the university, ultimately the rectorate has to take responsibility for that. They knew of the unfolding of this tragedy and they watched in silence. And, of course, the university media shares the blame. Please give us your motives for releasing this podcast. The university has engaged in conduct that is at odds with its mission and with its reputation. That conduct was extensive. The public has a right to know how one of its premier institutions has failed to live up to the higher ideals that we all expect. The news that I was accused of sexual harassment spread like wildfire. The news that the university had no evidence for the accusation did not. There is a social responsibility to telling this story. Creative efforts should be rewarded, not viewed as threats to the existing order. Facts and verifiable history should prevail over the urge to eliminate that which is not standard or common or immediately understood. For my creative contribution to the University of Basel, I received deceit and duplicity. Sexual harassment should not be used as a political tool. Students should not be threatened by professors for their outside activities. Students should not be kept from communicating with someone and they should not be asked to shun a co-worker or anyone else. Science projects should not be terminated improperly, implying that a scientific collaborator had committed a serious crime and also harming the university and students. I wish to clear my name. I want to work again in science. Socially, I was struggling to define who I was even before this attack. I might add that the university, with the manipulation of my contracts, has ruled out unemployment compensation, even though I worked there for three years. It appears that the Internet information about you from the USA has been very effective, as intended by the American lawyers. Indeed, American lawyers know how to use their influence, even in Switzerland. Considering your problems in the USA, you seem to have a gift for getting into trouble. What do you say to that? My problems in Switzerland are a continuation of the problems stemming from corrupt lawyers that I exposed in publications years ago. My motivation from the start, and still today, is justice for me and my son, and the emergence of the truth. That will not come without sacrifice. Did you ever think of giving up? Or, let me be more specific, Sometimes fighting more powerful forces becomes overwhelming. You could probably have saved yourself more trouble by not telling the story. We are quick to assess the costs that are associated with standing up to an injustice. But avoiding difficulties by ignoring an injustice also has associated costs. Those costs are less tangible, but they evolve and become greater with time. For me personally, the costs associated with allowing this kind of conduct to prevail is too high. What happened here was not only at my expense, it was also to the detriment of others, for example students and young women who might face serious cases of sexual harassment in the future. And finally, Mr. England, you wish to raise an issue that may well add gasoline to the fire, of an already sensational story. Yes, I do. I want it known that the three accused professors in my story are not Swiss by culture or tradition. They are foreign. They are German. 
And why should that matter? So the question I want to raise is this: Did culture and background play a role in the poor attitude displayed at the meeting that ended my career in ten minutes? An older German culture, as stamped into the world's memory, valued mindless authoritarianism, aggression, and displays of arrogance. These traits, in exaggeration, became a source of comedy and parody, even in Germany. Does it shock anyone that some of these cultural elements could persist today as remnants? After I left the ten-minute meeting, I reflected on how these three professors. Played so perfectly into the worst stereotypes that we have of the German culture, and with so little self-awareness. For example, the female professor in the trio, she actually engaged in a little, how should I put it, a victory dance. She was happy to see my career ended, as she stood up from her seat and declared, "He is the reason women are not in science." Now, please consider for a moment. In the first place, the meeting was improperly convened, characterized later as an inquisition. In context, her remarks represent arrogance par excellence. The other two professors sat there, cold as dead mackerels, and watched. No objection, not a word spoken. There was an unwillingness to even consider my side of the story. They simply seemed to be following orders. The orders had been written up in advance. My termination. Maybe these three foreign professors simply were not aware of Swiss tradition. I doubt that anyone would object to me saying, in general, that Swiss tend to be negotiators and not terminators. Had I encountered that attitude, we would not be here now. I say uncontestably. That I wish one of the professors present at the improperly convened meeting had been Swiss by tradition, but maybe if it had not been this particular clique of German professors, we would not have had the inappropriate meeting in the first place. The whole affair was so stereotypical that it begs the question that I raise. So does authoritarianism, with associated dysfunction and an absence of ethical considerations, Still persist as a remnant in the German culture. I think that many Swiss people still ask themselves this question. To the extent that you have a valid argument, we should nevertheless emphasize that generalizations can be out of place at some point. Yes, I do realize this, and I fully agree with you. Finally, I would like to say that a university is supposed to be a place of reason and discussion. We now make something possible outside the university that, unfortunately, should have been possible inside the university. Unlike Professor M, who terminated discussion by threat and fear-inducing behavior at the university, we now provide a forum for discussion on this website. Thank you, Mr. England, for this interview. It was a pleasure, Miss Idler. Thank you for your comprehensive preparatory work in helping me produce this interview. And to our listeners, we hope that you found our first podcast interesting and provocative, as promised, and that it serves to fuel debate. A number of points have been emphasized here. For one, the issue of proper workplace conduct has been raised. For another. The serious consequences that can result from broadcasting raw internet information. At a personal level, for me as a student of psychology and communications, I have been led to question whether the use of threats or instructions that limit or prevent communications between people ever have a rightful place, in particular at a university. This podcast is also an invitation for anyone to contact us. For an interview, either in response to Mr. England's story or any other topic, especially those that may not be reviewed adequately by other forms of media. Now it is time to bid our audience goodbye. We hope to have you visit us at utel.ch with your stories and your comments.